Testing, one, two, three, four. Jeremy Bernstein, tape, November 27, side A. Born July 26, 1928, New York City. My father is a doctor. One sister, Barbara, married, two children, lives in New Jersey, six years younger. Her husband is a lawyer. I was taught to play chess at the age of 12, but did not play seriously until about age of 17 when I joined the Marshall Chess Club in New York on West 10th Street, between 5th and 6th Avenue. Okay. Whatever, um, whatever came along. Did, did you have any particular uh, intellectual interests uh, as a child? Uh, did you remember? I mean, were you an avid reader? or? Uh... Uh, no. I, uh, uh, I had uh, few intellectual interests as a child. I... Uh, uh, was a school misfit and considered, uh, you know, reading a book, um, schoolwork. And I, I don't think I read a book for pleasure until after I graduated high school. Uh, well, what were you, what were you doing? I mean, your, well, your misfit, uh... well, I had, I had one thing I think that, uh, that, per, that perhaps, uh, helped me, uh, get over being a misfit. The school must fit, and that is that um, I became interested in photography uh, about the same time, 12 or 13. And I think that um, if you um, uh, get involved in any kind of uh, problem problem solving in depth on almost anything, it uh, is surprisingly similar to uh, uh, problem solving of anything, you know. Uh, I started out by just, you know, getting a camera and learning how to take pictures and learning how to print pictures and learning how to build a dark room and learning how to do all the technical things and uh, so on and so on. And then finally trying to find out how you could uh, sell pictures and become a, you know, would it be possible to be a professional photographer? And it was a case of over a period of, say, from the age of 13 to uh, 17, uh, you might say, uh, going through step by step by myself without anybody really helping me, the problem solving of being I mean, a photographer. And I found that, um, I think in looking back, that uh, the uh, this particular thing about problem solving is something that uh, schools generally don't teach you, and that uh, if you can develop uh, a kind of generalized approach to problem solving, that... Uh, it's surprising how it helps you in anything, you know, and that most of the most of the uh, deficiencies that uh, you see around you in people that uh, say are you don't think particularly you're doing their job right or something is really that I mean, assuming that they care, and you know, a lot of people that appear to care or may actually care are still not uh, going about things particularly the right way. It, when you think about it, I generally find that it's just that they don't have a good generalized approach to problem solving. They're not thorough. They uh, don't consider all the possibilities. They don't prepare themselves with the right information and so forth. So I think that photography, uh, though it seemed like a hobby and, uh, but, and, and ultimately led to a professional job in photography, uh, might have been more valuable than, uh, you know, uh, doing the proper things in school. Were you sort of the despair of your family at that time because of uh, your schoolwork, or, or, or did you? Well, it wasn't a real drama, you know. I, I imagine so, but uh, it was never a, as a, it was never completely apparent until I graduated from high school that I couldn't go to college because I graduated in 1945 when all the GIs were now pouring back on the GI Bill, and I had a 67 average, and it turned out that uh, there wasn't any college in the United States, even of the lowest caliber, who would take a student with less than a 75 average in that year. So I couldn't get in, I failed to get into college. Did you did you take uh, the, all these scholastic aptitude tests and so on? Or was they, were, they wouldn't consider you. In other words, they, they wouldn't even accept your application if you didn't have a 75 average in that particular year. Uh, looking back and sort of in retrospect, do you think not going to college was in a certain sense a fortunate thing? Oh, tremendously, because what happened is that um, uh, I, uh, well, I had developed myself as a photographer, and uh, prior to graduating high school, I'd act I had sold uh, two st picture stories to look, 
And um, what were they about? One was about a uh, teacher in high school named uh, Mr. Traister, T R A I S T E R, who taught English. And uh, he uh, used to uh, dramatize uh, Shakespeare. He would read the parts and act it out, and he made it very interesting. You know, it was one of the few courses that were interesting. <laughs> It, you know, most of the English courses that I had consisted of the teacher saying, um, you to read five pages of Silas Marner tonight. And the next day, the class was spent in sitting at the book like Emil Jennings in The Blue Angel, looking up over the book and saying, you know, Mr. Kubrick. And then you stand up and they say, uh, when Silas Marner walked out of the door, what did he see? And uh, if you didn't know what he saw, you got a zero. <laughs> and, that, and that was it. And as a matter of fact, I failed English. Once and had to make it up in summer uh, summer school. Uh, but did you show aptitude for things like mathematics and so on? Uh, and you, you, you got that really the only actually the only courses that I got good marks in were science courses. Yeah. I think I got I can't remember now, but I think I got about an eighty-seven in physics, uh, and uh, not in mathematics though, but in science courses I I liked and did reasonably well. But uh, anyway, Traster was one, and I forgot what the other one was now. But they bought these two pictures. Oh, and I also sold them a picture. I sold them two picture stories and a, and a photograph of a news dealer sitting on 170th Street in the Grand Concourse right across two blocks away from Taft High School. Is that where you went? Where yeah. Taft High School? yeah. Uh, with all the headlines saying uh, Roosevelt you know, dies or FDR dead. Yeah. And he was sitting there looking uh, depressed. And uh, they liked this picture and used it in a... Uh, a whole series about Roosevelt, and it was sort of the final picture of the of the series. Uh, were you interested in uh, in extracurricular activities apart from uh, photography as a high school student, or sports, or stuff like that? Or uh... well, I used to play, but I mean, uh, I wasn't on any of the school teams. Football? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I used to play everything, you know, but basketball and the concrete, uh, you know, outdoor. Uh, uh, what do they call them again? Basketball courts? No, no. You know, the uh, playgrounds. Oh, playgrounds. The playgrounds. The city playground. And uh, stickball, you know, in the street. And uh, the odd uh, softball game in the Taft uh, dirt, you know, uh, gym yard. They had a very large dirt gym yard. Oh. Things like that. Would you, would you say, Stanley, that... Touch that football in the street. The fact that uh, that you didn't go to college has given you a certain sense of uh, what one might call irreverence for, um, for for college graduates who don't meet up to uh, what you would consider to be your, uh, so to speak, your intellectual standards. I mean, if you come across a college guy who's got a lot of degrees but doesn't seem to, to radiate confidence, does it bug you? No, I don't think that I... Uh I don't think I look at it that way. No, the reason I think it was an uh, it was an advantage for me is that I then backed into this, uh, uh, you know, uh, fantastically good job at the age of seventeen. Uh, I went, I was, I went, I took, I can't remember what it was, but I took some pictures down there. I was now. What had happened is that I could not get into college, and um, uh, all sorts of things. My father, who was an alumni of M NYU, Uptown took me to see the dean, you know, and said, um, uh, you know, this is my son, and I was the student here, and so forth, and nothing worked. Uh, so I started going to City College at night under the hope that if I got a B average for so many credits, I don't remember now, that um, I could then get into day school, a, a day college. But within about, I don't know, a few weeks of this, I was down at Look with some other pictures, and... Uh, there was an extremely nice uh, picture editor then, whose name was Helen O'Brien. And um, the managing editor at the time was Jack Gunther, who was then sub later killed in the Bryce Canyon, Utah plane crash. And um, uh, she asked me what I was doing. And I told her, you know, nothing, and that I was going to try to, you know, what it happened. And uh, she said... Uh, Something about, you know, uh, she thought she might be able to get me a job as an apprentice photographer. And, uh, you know, so I went up to see Jack Gunther and so forth, and I got a job. And and uh, how long were you a photographer, actually, on, on, on Look? 
well, I was a I was apprentice photographer for six months, and then I became a uh, staff photographer, and I was there for four years. And so you were actually there until until age twenty one. Yeah, and of course that would have been the you know the period I'd spent in college, and I think that the uh, you know the things what I learned and uh, the practical experience uh, in every respect, including photography. What I learned in in that four year period exceeded what I could have learned in school, and um, also getting out of school, I can't remember what was the the uh, particular turning point, but being out of school, I began to read, and uh, within a relatively short period of time, I would imagine caught up with where I probably should have been had I had a a modicum of interest in things in high school. Because I mean, after all, you really only miss. I mean, before you're 12 or 13, how many how many serious books can you read? So I only really blew four years of part-time reading. Uh, how much time you go to school all day, you play a certain amount, you got to do your homework. So in retrospect, I don't feel that I missed reading that many books, and I felt that I I caught up pretty quickly when I became interested in uh, in things in general. Well, what what first gave you the idea of uh Actually, going into the movies as opposed to uh... like uh, everybody else, you know, I was always very interested in movies, and I used to go uh, to see films, and uh, I'd say practically every film, and uh, I used to see all the films at the Museum of Modern Art and the Thalia, and uh, actually at that time, um, you know, when I was a teenager, there were the art, the, the so-called art house didn't really exist. In the uh, to the extent it does now, you know, it was the post-war Italian uh, sort of uh, the Rossellini pictures, which uh, brought the art houses into existence. So there weren't that many good films that were ever played in, uh, you know, the theaters around, except the museum. Anyway, I used to see all the films, and I knew I'd seen them all a number of times at the museum. And um, a friend of mine who subsequently has become a film director named Alex Singer, uh, was working as an office boy at the March of Time. And uh, one day he told me that uh, it cost $40,000 to make a March of Time, and it was a one-reeler. And I said to him, gee, that's a lot of money. I said, uh, I can't believe it cost that much to make, you know, eight, eight or nine minutes of film. So I called up uh, Eastman Kodak and checked on the price of film. And then I call up the, <clears throat> the laboratory and find out how much it costs to develop it. And I checked on how much it costs to rent 35-millimeter movie cameras. And uh, then I checked the cost of the other facilities, sound and editing and so forth. And um, uh, I forgot what it added up to, but it was it was um, something like uh, that I could do a documentary film with an original music score and everything for about uh, $3,500. So I thought, gee, if they're making these pictures for 40000 and I can make them for $3,500, uh, surely I must be able to sell them and at least get my money back and probably make a profit, you know? So, uh, in fact, I think we thought that we could make a considerable profit because we assumed that if they were making them for $40,000 a piece, that they must be making a profit, you know? And uh, so... Uh, I rented a uh, 35 millimeter IMO camera, that's spelled E Y E M O, which is a spring wound camera, produces a professional picture. And I did a, a documentary film um, about a boxer named Walter Cartier, who I had previously done a picture story for Look About, and I knew him. And it was called Day of the Fight. And um, got the whole thing, you know, did, ev- did everything. Uh, Alex helped me, you know, sort of carried lights around and assisted me. And I did the whole thing just myself and Alex and Walter and his people that he knew and um, cut it. And uh, another friend of mine who subsequently has become a professional movie composer named Gerald Freed, F-R-I-E-D, did a film score and got the whole thing finished for $3,900. And uh, then when uh, we began to take it around, to the various companies to, to sell it. They all liked it, but we were offered things like $1,500 and $2,500 and so forth. 
And, uh, Dude, this what, is, by the way, when you were still age 21, roughly. Uh, well, less than that. Less, probably about, less than that. I, I did this about, oh, I'd say mm -hmm. uh, maybe nine months before I quit. Look, about 20 plus. Yeah. And uh, at one point I said to them, you know, Christ, uh, uh, why, are you, why are you offering us so little for this? You know, one real short, you know, get more than $40,000. And they said, what, you must be crazy. And I said, why do you think that? And the, so I told them about the March of Time. And uh, anyway, they, they, they said it was, you know, was ridiculous. And shortly after that, the March of Time went out of business <laughs> for the reason. We later found out that they were spending approximately, I mean, uh, you know, if the March of Time um, sues me for this, Alex somehow found out when he was working there that that it was costing 40000 bucks to make one of their one reelers. And uh, they went out of business. Well, anyway, I finally sold the film to uh, RKO Pathé, who uh, are no longer in business either, and uh, sold it for about $100 less than it cost me to make it. I know it was a small loss. But uh, I had the pleasure of seeing it shown, and uh, you know, I remember I went to the Paramount Theater, where it was playing with some Ava Gardner, Robert Mitchum picture, and you know, it was very exciting to see it on the screen, and it got a nationwide, nationwide and worldwide distribution, and so um, I thought uh, everybody liked it, and they thought it was good, and I thought that this would be, uh, I'd get millions of offers, from which I got none to do anything, so I uh, made another. Uh, documentary, this time about a flying priest, uh, Father, or Father Stockmuller or something, in New Mexico, who uh, flew a Piper Cub around to Indian parishes. I know Archeo thought it was a colorful subject, and so I went there and pretty much on my own again made this short, and uh, still, you know, nothing was happening. And, did, did they, uh, were they supporting him for this? Or? No, they gave me uh, $1,500, and of which I had to pay for the film, the travel, and everything. I made nothing. I think I lost money on that, too. But I, I had been making a reasonably good salary at Look for four years, so I had a certain amount of money, and I was still working. So then I quit Look, because I decided that um, there obviously wasn't any money in shorts, but that... I then found out how much feature films were being made for, and, uh, you know, millions, and I had calculated that I could make a feature film for about $10,000, and, uh... Well, how did you, how did you calculate that? Well, again, by, you know, projecting the amount of film I'd shoot, figuring that I could get actors to work for practically nothing, you know, work with, uh, I mean, at this point, I was the whole crew, cameraman, assistant cameraman, uh, you know, director, uh, everything, so I had no cost, so... A friend of mine in the village uh, did a script. Were you living in the village in those days? I was living on 16th Street, off 6th Avenue. And uh, he uh, he did a script which was a terrible, sort of dull, uh, undramatic, but very, very serious allegorical story about four soldiers from an unnamed country lost behind enemy lines trying to find their way home again. And it had uh, lines in it like, uh, we spend our lives running our fingers down the lists of names and, and addresses looking for our real... No, running our name, fingers down the lists of something or other, looking for our real names or our real addresses. I can't remember what the line is, but it was that kind of a thing, you know? And of course, uh, I... Uh, totally failed to recognize the what I didn't know about making films or anything. You know, I just thought, well, these other two things have turned out pretty well, but they were documentaries. And um, the, the second thing had turned out pretty well. Yeah. But I, I, I didn't really know what I didn't know. And I thought, well, Christ, uh, um, there really is, can't be very much more to making a feature film. And I certainly couldn't make one worse than the films that I kept seeing every week. And, um, but, uh, I wasn't satisfied to just, uh, make a, a, you know, an interesting film. I wanted it to be a very 
poetic and uh, meaningful film. And it was a little bit like the Thurber story about the midget, you know, who wouldn't take the base on balls. <laughs> <laughs> And decided to swing, you know. <laughs> and uh, so it, uh, I got the film made, and uh, but it was uh, a very, very dull. And it got an art house distribution. It was called Fear and Desire, distributed by Joseph Burston, who was the, at one time, I, I think he was the distributor who first brought in Rossellini's pictures. It got a few reasonably good reviews. It got a nice blurb from Mark Van Doren. And, uh, who was very kind about it. And it had a few, you know, it had a few good moments in it, but with the exception of, uh, one or two of the actors, they were all terrible actors, and I knew nothing about directing <laughs> any actors. Well, how, and, did you, how did you go about directing them? Just sort of, uh, well, I just, directing? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was really, you know, just, uh, uh, it was really just, uh, well, actually, from some of the so-called professional efforts I've subsequently seen, you know, people doing, I would say I didn't go about it that much differently than a lot of people do, but I didn't really know anything, you know. Uh, but there were there were some good moments in it, and uh, as I say, it even got a few good reviews. But uh, it uh, never never returned a penny of its investment. Uh, Was this your own dough you put up? No. I, I raised the money privately, and uh, then while this picture was uh, took a long time to edit the film and get all the you know the thing done, I, I spent over a year on it, and uh, uh, it opened at the Guild Theater in New York, and it was pretty apparent, you know, that it was terrible, you know, and. Uh, while it was still playing, I decided, well, I'd better, uh, I'd better get another script very fast, uh, and try to promote some more money on the strength of the, just the fact that the thing was playing. Because, uh, I, it wasn't apparent to me how I was gonna earn a living or do anything, you know. And again, no, not one single offer ever to do anything, you know, from anybody. So I, uh, in about two weeks, knocked together another script with somebody and um, this time it was sort of a reaction to the other one. Uh, this was nothing but action sequences and a more sort of mechanically constructed uh, sort of action gangster plot. What, was this was this the time you were also hustling chess, uh, Stanley? Hmm. <laughs> well, uh, I wasn't hustling chess, <coughs> but I was playing uh, chess for quarters. I mean, I. I wasn't a hustler in that I pretended not to be a good player and, and beat people. I just was playing in the park, you know, for quarters, quarter a game. Uh, but were you actually were you doing this for the fun of it, or, or were you also hoping to make no, a living? No, I was doing it for the fun of it, but I also did make about 2 or $3 a day, which uh, it really goes a long way if you're not buying anything except food. Yeah. Uh, well, do you, do you still uh, retain a lot of... Uh, a lot of acquaintances from that uh, from that era. I mean, guys that you. Uh... There's only one person, one one friend who I still see, a boy named David Miller, who uh, is a uh, operations research analyst, and who I've remained friendly with. I still know all the people there, you know, like Duval and Feldman, and uh, there's a guy named Edmund Peckover. But the, the regulars at the park don't change too much. Well, was there a kind of fraternity of people playing for money? I mean, uh, I don't know whether... They're, no. Yeah, there was... Well, I mean, there were, there were the regulars, you know, like the real regulars used to be Arthur Feldman, who was really the best player there. And he also played for dollars? Oh, yeah. I mean, all the regulars played for money. There was Arthur Feldman, I'd say, who was the best player. Uh, then there was a guy named Joe Richmond, who was probably the next best player. Then there was a guy named Edmund Peckover. I would have put him, say, third. And uh, another uh, regular was a guy named Amos Kaminsky, who was, a, who, who was a physicist. He would have been next. Then I would say myself and David Miller, <laughs> uh, about equal. 
And then it was descending. I mean, I was only interested in the people who were better than I was, you know, so those are the ones that I particularly remember because they were enjoyable to play with. And then there was a whole lot of potzers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> From whom you earned your living. And semi potzers, you know, uh, and people who put up fierce struggles, you know, but who invariably lost, you know. Uh, How many hours a day were you, uh, were you putting in down there? Well, when I was waiting for things to happen, you know, waiting to get an answer on something, which went on for months, you know, sometimes, um, I would go there uh, about 12 o'clock and stay there until, you know, midnight. I'd say a good 12 hours a day with breaks for food. Uh, you were sort of playing under the lights? Oh, yeah. In the summer, it was marvelous. You know, you'd get, uh, out of doors with those concrete tables. Though. Yeah. In the daytime, you get a, tri uh, a, a, a table in the shade. And at night, you get a table by the light. <laughs> <laughs> and if you made the switch the right way, you had a good table all the time. You know, but, um, you know there are those two end tables where the light is by the fountain yeah. that have the best light at night. And those were always the tables at night that you were trying to get. And did you have a sort of regular clientele of guys uh, uh, who would just, you know, out of sort of uh, misguided pride would come back? And, uh, well, I used to play, of course, a lot with the better players because they'd give me odds. And because, uh, you know, they, they couldn't get a game, really. For instance, uh, Feldman used to give me a pawn and move. And with a pawn and move, I never really kept track, but it was pretty even. I mean, Feldman didn't make his living off me, you know, but when there was no sort of real potters around, then the other, then the better players would play each other. And, uh, would, it would give, you know, fair odds, so there would be a pretty good game. Like there were some players that would just give you uh, always white, which was a small advantage, but it was an advantage. Pawn and move, of course, is, is, uh, well, the smallest advantage would be white, then the next advantage would be uh, two moves, you know, and uh, then the next one would be pawn and move, you know. Uh, how, how did you stack up in the Marshall Chess Club? How would you stack yourself up in the Marshall Chess Club? Um, I won the B tournament, and uh, I played in one A tournament and finished around in the middle. Uh, but you think that... You well, I would like to point out to you that the A tournament, though, is not the top tournament. The top tournament is the club championship. So, uh, you know, that's that you can figure out where I stood. But you, uh, you think you, you could you would you know, give Duval a, a pawn and move, roughly? Is that a serious uh, appraisal? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's rather depressing. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> when did you get uh, when did you get uh, launched after this uh, after this point in, in, into the movies again? Well, I uh, as I say, when Fear and Desire was still playing the Gill Theater, I spent about two weeks lashing together this uh, all action script. And uh, let's see now, what is he in relation to the family? Well, the, the guy's name was. Uh, Mo Bowsell, B O U S E L, and he has two drugstores in the Bronx. Yeah. Mo Bowsell uh, co produced and put up the money to make Killer's Kiss. His name is Morris Bowsell. And that. Uh, M O R R I S, B O U S E L. That was not a great financial success. It was at that time that I was playing chess for quarters in the park. I told him that there was a. Speaking of Jimmy Harris. Uh, there, was a guy, there was a guy in a village uh, who was uh, making films by him, by himself and just doing everything together. And that um, he thought that uh, you and he should get together and introduced you. And then uh, uh, Jimmy suggested that, I mean, this is the impression I got, which may be wrong. Jimmy suggested that uh, uh, he could take the producing burden of the films. Is that, is that right? Uh, uh, finance the films or something? Yeah, well, I had made Killer's Kiss, the second feature film, and um, um, substantially that's what uh, happened. Well, first Jimmy and I made The Killing, and... Uh, you mean you made that by yourselves? Or? No, we, we, uh, well, we formed the company, which was called Harris Kubrick Pictures Corporation, and... Uh, after looking for a story, we uh, bought a book called The Clean Break by Lionel White, 
And this um, was the story that we made into the killing for United Artists. United Artists had bought Killer's Kiss. Well, first of all, United Artists' uh, function uh, was only to finance and distribute the films. It was up to us to hire the people and uh, make the film. And uh, I presume that United Artists thought that if uh, The Killer's Kiss could be made, you know, on the semi-professional basis it was, that with an adequate amount of money, which was fairly minimum, anyway, that, uh, you know, we could make a film. Jimmy had to guarantee completion of the movie, which means that if the movie uh, ran over the budget, he had to put up all the extra money, which is a great safeguard. And especially since financially he was responsible to make this kind of a guarantee, uh, it wasn't that much of a risk on the part of United Artists. Well, we had a very good cast, but um, none of the people were uh, big stars in the sense that they... Uh, were extremely choosy about what they were in. And I would say that uh, all of them had probably uh, been in uh, worse films than they might have, even at the beginning, thought this one might turn out to be. Wasn't Marilyn Monroe... The, the principal cast was Sterling Hayden, uh, Colleen Gray, uh, Marie Windsor, Elisha Cook Jr., Joe Sawyer, Ted DeCorsia. Vince Edwards. I, I saw that film. Uh, who we you know became Doctor Kildare. So long ago that I, I, I try, I'm just trying to remember. Well, how how was the one where uh, Sterling Hayden uh, dies in the end? Isn't that right? No, he gives up. The money blows away at the airport, and he gives up. I'm very confused. You probably haven't seen the picture. No, I remember Sterling Hayden very clearly, but I can't. You're thinking of the Asphalt Jungle. That's why you thought Marilyn Monroe was in it. He dies at the end of the Asphalt Jungle <laughs> <clears throat> in a field with a horse. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're thinking of the wrong picture. You never saw The Killing. Maybe, maybe that's yeah. right. If you want to see it, there's a print at the Museum of Modern Art. Artists, you know, the artists could give you the print. So anyway, we made The Killing, and... Um, uh, Somehow, Dory Sherry saw it, and he liked it, and uh, he was the first one who um, really showed any interest in us, so, you know, and to the extent of offering us any sort of a deal to make another picture, and uh, so we went to MGM and uh, looked through the, uh, the deal was that we could look through all their backlog of story properties, and... Uh, you know, if we found one that they liked, we could do it. And um, I think I tell you this. We came up with this Burning Secret by Stephen Zweig. And uh, I did the screenplay with Calder Willingham, about which time Dory Sherry was, uh, you know, uh, t not taken out of, his, you know, his job. And the project came to an end. Sort of before, you know, just about the time the script was finished. Uh, and it, it, was at, it was at that point that uh, you uh, you ran across the uh, the old war story. Well, it was really uh, sort of concurrent with this that I remembered reading Paths of Glory as a as a one of the few books that I did read. Uh, is it is it a fair description of Jimmy to say that he's independently wealthy? Is that uh, Yes. You have to have patience because um, if you don't, your own frustrations uh, prove to be too much of a distraction. It is a slow, you know, uh, it's like uh, those games where you jiggle all the balls into place. Sometimes there's more balls you're jiggling than others, but it's largely that. And uh, if you allow yourself to become irritated, then it's just another distraction. Well, uh how do you keep yourself, uh, so to speak, amused when, uh, I mean, there are all kinds of minor delays uh, where something breaks and you've got to go sit down. Because I keep and thinking about the next things that I'm doing. You know, I just, uh, I try to use all the time. That's why I found, for instance, when all these people were there, I found myself in a slightly uh, up in the air feeling. Luckily, this stuff was quite simple. But um, I usually, uh, I would imagine to anyone 
sort of looking at me, I have a sort of vague, withdrawn look on my face because what I'm just doing is thinking about uh, what I'm about to do or what other scenes, why don't I just use the time to think? It's like sitting in the park playing chess. Well, I mean, do you think about uh, about how to uh, manipulate the actors and that sort of thing? I mean, well, I think about whatever problems are problems. I mean, sometimes manipulating the actors aren't the problem. Sometimes the problem is the story or uh, the schedule or uh, a set that isn't completely designed or something. But whatever it is, I always have plenty to think about. Well, how close do you permit yourself to get to the actors as friends? I mean, is it bad to be uh, confronting with the, with the guys who are working for you? Or? No. I mean, if you can, I mean, in other words, if it's bad if you don't like somebody to have a bad social uh, situation occur, like uh, an attempt at uh, friendliness, which turns out to be sour, or, you know, uh, his wife goes away saying how terrible you are, or something like that. But I mean, if you if you like the people, uh, it's uh, it helps to know them, and it's uh, enjoyable to be with them. Yeah. It's not awkward to apply discipline or anything? If you, uh, I suppose it isn't really discipline. Well, it isn't discipline anyway, because um, uh, unless the actor... Uh, it's so rare that you, that, that you would ever get to the point where you'd say to the actor, look, this is my picture, and you're working for me, and you do it the way I want to go home. Because what you really want him to do is to uh, feel confident and enjoy what he's doing. Otherwise, he's not going to be able to do it very well. So... Somehow you have to be clever enough to, um, uh, or persuasive enough to, uh, uh, although persuasive isn't even the right word, because I, th- I, I tend to believe that if you're right, people realize it. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you usually right, Sammy? Well, I, I try to be. <laughs> no, but I have found that when I am right, you know, when in, when in retrospect it turned out to be always right, and uh, in doing it, it was it seemed right. And so that that you you do not usually find difficulties arising if you're right, unless the actor is incapable of doing what you're asking him to do for limitations of his talent or his emotional range or something, and he um, gets insecure and uh, thinks of a lot of reasons why you're wrong. But really, what he what he what he's trying to do is avoid failing, you know, but then really you should try to figure out what the limitations of the actors are and never put them in a spot like that. After leaving MGM uh, and The Burning Secret, uh, prior to this, Jimmy and I had bought Paths of Glory. I did a screenplay with Jim Thompson and Calder Willingham, and uh, nobody wanted to do it. It was turned down by every company until... uh, our agent, Ronnie Lubin, L-U-B-I-N, interested Kirk Douglas in the project. And uh, through Kirk's interest, uh, United Artists put up the money on uh, the basis of it being done for a very low budget in Europe. The picture uh, was a moderate success, uh, but it was nothing to uh, create... Uh, opportunities for us because of uh, big grosses or uh, profits. The reviews on it were very good. Many reviews were superlative. And uh, uh, from that point of view, it was an enormous success. The greatest uh, virtue of the film was that I met my wife, Christiana, who uh, was an actress. I was watching a television broadcast, looking for an, an actress, actually watching someone else and saw her, and uh, got in touch with her agent. She came into the studio. We met. I began dating her, and we subsequently got married a year later. She uh, is a marvelous actress. She had done a lot of work in Germany. Uh, I would like her to... Uh, act, but uh, she has no interest in doing dull, routine uh, acting things and is more interested in painting. If I ever have a part, a decent part for a woman, which for some reason I never seem to write into my films, um, she would certainly do it. 
This is followed by about six months spent working on a script for Kirk Douglas, which he didn't like and was abandoned, and uh, some more months working on something which Gregory Peck was supposed to do for us, which was also abandoned because it wasn't liked, and uh, followed by uh, the offer from Marlon Brando to direct his Western, which resulted in six months of work, again, uh, abandoned as far as I was concerned because I left the project two weeks before it started. Uh, this was followed by a script called The German Lieutenant, which again no one liked, and uh, followed by Kurt Douglas's offer to take over Spartacus after a week of shooting, uh, which I did. And, um, and you find yourself... Yes, my narrative criticisms, which were at first so uh, enthusiastically received, began to grow pale as time went on due to the uh, counter-pressures of the writer Dalton Trumbo and Kirk's producer Eddie Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, who did not see eye to eye to me with me on the story. Really Between the shooting and the editing of Spartacus, uh, uh, two children were born to me, to Krishnana, uh, Vivian and Anya and Vivian. I was on the picture almost two years. Children's names, Vivian, Vanessa, age five, Anya, Renata, age six, Catherine, Susanna, Catherine spelled K and an E at the end, uh, age 11. Uh, only a f about eight weeks was spent in Spain doing the battles and the big march buys. <laughs> the whole picture was done on the back lot at Universal. Uh, did, did you get uh, any sense of... Uh intellectual satisfaction out of the Spartacus at all? No, but it was, you know, uh, again, an opportunity to uh, work. And uh, it was interesting to, uh, from a purely, uh, as an exercise, you know, to try to do scenes that uh, you thought weren't very good and to try to make them interesting. Uh, I thought the first 45 minutes of the film, of the life in the gladiatorial school, which was simple, uh, turned out quite well as far as I'm concerned, but then the rest of the story from the slave rebellion on to the end, I thought, seemed um, a bit silly. Let's see, and then, and then what happened? Uh, at, at, at well, point? during the making of Spartacus, we bought Lolita, Jimmy and I, and uh, now nobody wanted to make Lolita. Actually, the history of all the films, practically, that I've done is that no one ever wanted to particularly make them, and we just sort of running out the clock managed to put the picture together someplace, you know. Well, nobody particularly wanted to make Lolita. either. And uh, finally, uh, Seven Arts, a company named Seven Arts, put up the money and we made it. It was made in England. Did you do? Uh, did you yourself do a good deal of rewriting of the uh, of, of the book? And, uh... Yes. Well, Nabokov and I, well, I believe, uh, got along very well. And uh, is it, hey, I know he liked the film very much when he saw it. Uh, is there anything that's particularly uh, striking about 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 the making of that film that uh, uh, that you remember or? Well, uh, no. You mean anecdotes? Not really. I think uh, the only thing that is regrettable about the film is that due to the incredible pressure against making the film and put on by the car log by all sorts of groups, um, although I think the film was faithful psychologically to all the characters and ca captured, I think, the sense of them, I think that the... Uh, total uh, lack of eroticism in the story, in this film presentation of it, um, spoils some of the pleasure of it. Um, you know, you can imply all the eroticism you want, but there's nothing like uh, delivering some to help understand a little more the enslavement, you know, that Humbert Humbert uh, was under. I think that... Uh, that would I, I would I would consider that a criticism of of the film, but one that was, you know, if you could the film could not have been made, 
you know, nobody would have made it at all, and it would never have been distributed. Um, there was some criticism by some people that said that she looked too old, but uh, I never thought that was a valid criticism because the uh, it was one of those books where nobody bothered to really read the description that Humbert Humbert gave of Lolita, and uh, they got this that somehow the, every, it was an, a rather interesting example of sort of mass delusion because it's almost inevitably people imagined her as being about nine years old and uh, looking about nine or ten years old and yet there's a very clear description in the book of Annabelle his uh, childhood uh, sweetheart and he and he says uh, in the narrative that were it not for Annabelle, they would never know Lolita. And then when he sees Lolita, he says that she was a perfect reincarnation of Annabelle. And Annabelle is described as a, you know, a, a pretty sexy uh, twelve and a half. I forgot. I, actually, I don't exactly remember Annabelle's age, but I know that Lolita was uh, something like um, twelve years and three months when he meets her. And then the story progresses through uh, quite a few years. Well, Sue Lyon was actually just 13 when we made the picture. And I thought this this criticism was not valid. I, many of the people who wrote it, I think, um, well, I know, didn't bother to really read what he, how old he said she was and what she looked like. And um, there was this peculiar example of a lot of people imagining her as, as being about 10 years old. Uh, it was strange. That was the first film you made where you proceeded really from an intellectual, uh, an intellectual premise rather than from a story, or from an intellectual uh, situation rather than from a specific story. Mm. Curiosity about uh, uh, the possible outcomes of uh, nuclear strategy. Mm. Uh, how did that uh, that come about? Uh, well, I was interested in uh, whether or not I was going to get blown up by an H-bomb prior to uh, Lolita, but uh, my uh, interest intensified itself sort of concurrently with that. I believe that um, the Berlin crisis took place... Uh, during uh, Lolita, and about that time, I became keenly interested and started reading up on all the, you know, literature of which there is a terrific extent, you know, a tremendous a lot. Boy, am I getting fucked up on that? <laughs> a tremendous a lot. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, I read. Uh, I would say I pretty much read the uh, the spectrum. You know, I began finding after a while that I wasn't reading anything new, and I decided I knew the whole thing, you know. And uh, it was then that I began to... Um, the thing that struck me most of all about it was that at first, when you read the uh, brilliant analyses and the games theories and Herman Kahn, you, you're very reassured because you, you start off by thinking, gee, you know... Uh, uh, you know, God, there are these bombs, and you get an image vaguely of sort of a World War II mentality. And then when you read um, the literature in the field, your first reaction, superficially, is you're very encouraged because you suddenly realize there's this whole uh, body of thought that's gone into the whole thing, and, it, and you think, ah, yes, well, now I... And then as you read on and on and become more involved, then you begin to realize that all these things lead to very paradoxical outcomes. And... Uh, in reviewing the whole thing, every line in it leads to a paradoxical point. And uh, I suppose this was the most uh, thematically obvious thing about that to Strange Love was the uh, paradoxical outcome of any particular line of thought. Well, if it, if it really is true in the real world that every line does lead to a paradoxical outcome, what, what hope is that for you? Uh, well, personally, I, I think that the hope is... Uh, Basically, just luck. The situation is simply for, for just luck reasons is never really put to uh, 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 any particularly great strain. 
a lot, of course, you know, a lot has been done, a lot keeps being done about trying to improve uh, the situation against accidental war and uh, better command and control and a uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, threat technique of trying to graduate threats into as many steps as you can to leave as many alternatives and back away points. But um, the pressing thing is that at every at every period of history, the people uh, always thought that they had. Uh, I mean, the the uh, power structure and the uh, leaders always looked back on the previous uh, period of history and thought that they had learned something. And uh, I think that you know the old uh, thing about the only only thing you can learn about history is that you can't learn from history is is probably true and that this uh, this illusion that you get that you're much more sophisticated and that you can never it can never happen that way again uh, may be true uh, but the thing you don't realize is that it'll happen a different way you know i mean now that everybody's very convinced that they'll never have another 1914 type situation uh you know well, they may have a 1985 type situation that they're not prepared for. Well, it's like what they say about the French army always being perfectly prepared for the last. Yeah, well, most armies are. You know, you'd find the, the occasional exception like uh, Nazi Germany. But uh, in, inevitably, uh, I think that as time goes on, uh, the danger increases because uh, the thing becomes more and more remote. I mean, the problem to begin with is that People do not react to abstractions. You know, they only react to uh, direct experience. Very few people are even interested in abstractions, and even fewer people can become emotionally involved or emotionally react to an abstract thing. Um, the only reality that n n nuclear uh, weapons have are a few movie shots of uh, mushroom clouds and a few documentaries that occasionally show in art houses about uh, the effects of Hiroshima, but that the, the atomic bomb is uh, as much of an abstraction as uh, you could possibly have. I mean, it's as abstract as the fact that uh, you know that someday you'll die. It's something that you know, but you really uh, you do a very good job. No, and you do an excellent job of uh, denying it psychologically. So... Um, to begin with, uh, because of the very effective denial and the lack of any evidence, uh, there's almost no interest in the problem. I mean, most I would say in the minds of most people, it's it's less interesting even than uh, city government, you know. <laughs> and, and, and the longer the time goes on without the thing happening, this illusion is created that somehow it's like money in the bank or you're building up security. In fact, I think you're just becoming more accustomed to it and uh, more more liable to think that at some point uh, that you've been taking these wonderful precautions and that uh, the chances are minimized and so forth, and then finally you will get confronted with a situation that you couldn't anticipate. For instance, um, even now I think that it surprises me that Russia and the United States uh, could do a lot to uh, almost completely eliminate the possibility of accidental nuclear war without any real uh, loss of security, both of them could allow uh, observers in key places to instantly authenticate whether or not a nuclear war was in progress, you know, or it seemed to be uh, in process of happening. And that if there were uh, some nuclear accident or a screwball, you know, a nuclear, uh, psychotic, uh, you know, the mad major or the... Uh, missile that gets away, you can instantly authenticate that this might be true. Uh, I, I, I know that the United States seems anyway geared not to respond to, uh, uh, say, a single nuclear explosion any place, at least that's what they say, that they now have, uh, they feel invulnerable retaliatory capabilities, and uh, that the single city taken out would not start the nuclear war. But, you know, again, you never know that panic that happens when suddenly all the lights go out, like you described in New York City, you know, that indefinable something that might just make the senior decision maker abandon all his previously beautifully worked out, uh, graduated 
uh, steps of response, you never know. And it depends on who he is and uh, what his personal state of mind is, what information is available to him, and so forth. Um, the fact that the, a lot of effort has been gone to to try to work out possible accidents, and I, I suspect that um, great precautions have been taken to protect against these accidents, but whether uh, the uh, human imagination is capable of really devising the, the subtle uh, permutations and psychological variants to all those things, I doubt. Uh, the people who make up these uh, war scenarios are uh, not really as inventive, say, as a great writer or as reality. Uh, I think Herman Kahn is a, is a genius, and I think that he can envision certain situations, but when you read the uh, many of the sort of war scenario possibilities, they don't strike you as being the work of a master novelist. They don't really seem real. You know, they're political possibilities, but they don't have the real trappings of reality that might, you know, confuse and panic the decision maker in the real circumstance. Were, were you surprised at the at the reaction to, to Strange Love, the fact that it was uh, uh, so uh, so widely discussed and so... Uh, Widely reviewed, and uh, do, did you have any? Did you have any feeling of uh, of what of what the response would be to it? Uh, well, I mean, uh, all films are reviewed. Uh, it, 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 the discussion went beyond reviews, uh, but um, I know. I mean, it was quite obviously something that uh, might become a controversial uh, issue. Well, when you when you got finished with it, did you did you have a sense that, in some sense, that it was a winner? I mean, was it a thing that you really? Uh, well, I was very pleased with it. I mean, when you say a winner, I mean, I I I thought it was a, I was very pleased with the film. Um, it happened to also be um a very successful film commercially. How, how did Terry Sutton get into the act? Well, um. Terry uh, came to uh, interview me for uh, Show Magazine uh, shortly before I was leaving for London to make the picture, and uh, I became yeah I became friendly with him. I had read uh, the Magic Christian and Flesh and Filigree, and I thought he was a terrific writer. And uh, I came to London. And started. You had the script uh, pretty well. Oh, the script was the script was was done, and it was done in its black comedy form. Uh, a fact which uh, a certain amount of confusion has been <laughs> created about in certain areas. Uh, the script was done. Peter Sellers was cast, uh, and I was coming over here to prepare the film. And I, you know, thought Terry was very talented. I never stop working on a script. I like to work with somebody else because under the time pressures that you're under, you can't afford the sort of uh, lapse of intensity that if you work by yourself, you might suffer. And uh, Terry seemed like an ideal person because the um, uh, style of the script was um, similar, you know, to his sense of humor. And uh, so about six weeks before the picture started, uh, I asked him if he wanted to come over here and work on it with me and do some more dialogue and revision. And he came over. He worked for six weeks, and that was it. Uh, I started the picture, and he went off and did some other things. Uh, have, have any of the pictures been as intellectually complicated as uh, as uh, the present one? I mean, the 2001 caused as many intellectual uh, problems. I mean, that's a, it's a terrific uh, undertaking to kind of create the, uh, the future. Well, um, I, I don't know what you... Intellectually complicated isn't really the right description for it, I don't think. I mean, Strange Love was a more intellectually complicated picture. And, you know, it involved complex arguments and uh, quite a few, uh, you know, abstract ideas, you know, clearly... Or comically stated, uh, this is not a, as complex a picture 
it's not as uh, complicated a picture in terms of uh, you know uh, ideas represented you know, ideas actually spoken you know in praise of Arthur C. Clarke uh, it is true that he is um, he he is uh, I think the most poetic uh, science fiction writer. Well, he's also nearly the best informed, I think. Right. He is scientifically the best informed. Uh, his narrative ideas, I think, are, for my tastes, the most appealing. And he has this um, rather unique poetic sense of the uh, a sort of nostalgia for the... Uh, you know the mountains that have eroded away over millions of years, and the uh, millions of years in the future, and people looking back and forward. And uh, you'll have to fix this up because it sounds like real crap. But uh, it's very hard to you know define it nicely. But well, it is I, true I, that I he. I ha- find that every time I finish reading some some story like that of, of Arthur's about, mm. I always feel sad when I go. Right. There's some element of sadness. Right. Like, Either we we made uh, Venus, or right. we contaminated Venus, or there are, he has a vision of some something in the future which you know you'll never see, or right? Something or something it. in the past that 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 you can never know about. Yeah. Well, but that's I think that's marvelous. You know, I think that somehow, uh, without trying to without making it sound too uh, pompous or precious, that that uh, he captures the uh, hopeless but uh, admirable human. Uh, desire to know, you know, uh, these things that they never will, you know, can never really know, and to reach for things that they can never, you know, really uh, reach or reach back, and you know, yeah. it, it, it's very hard to say it exactly. But this sense of sadness yeah. and this poetic sense of time passing and uh, the sort of loneliness of, uh, you know, uh, worlds. I mean, he manages. I tell you what, he also manages to do. He he can. He can take um, a star, a sun, say, and uh, in that one story, uh, I forgot the name of it, where the uh, uh, the sort of sun creatures come towards Mercury. He can take an, an inanimate object, uh, like a star or a world or even a galaxy, and uh, somehow uh, make it into a... Uh, a very poignant uh, thing which almost seems alive. He has a way of um, writing about, uh, you know, mountains and planets and uh, worlds with the same poignancy that people write about uh, children or love affairs. And uh... Also, although you haven't read the script and you shouldn't really try to refer to the story, there is, the, 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 without uh, underlining it, there is a contrast in the story between uh, uh, giant orbiting bombs which you might say is the uh, negative use of nuclear energy, and this particular spaceship, which leads to um, uh, great, uh, fantastic uh, accomplishments, which is also another the, the, the good the good use of nuclear energy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think I think one can um, you know one can talk about the talk about the Orion, which is something mm-hmm. I wanted to do for a long time. In fact, good. I have a. A set of, a way of pounding that, yeah. Yeah, I have a set of notes uh, uh, somewhere uh, at home, uh, which I once took down for just writing a piece on the on the Orion, showing why, showing sort of logically speaking, why it is the only propulsion system that's worth considering if mm-hmm. you talk really about interplanetary missions. There's nothing else that makes any sense. Right. Fundamentally, because its operating temperature is is, is at the escape velocity. That, that's really the crucial uh, mm-hmm. element in it. And uh, so that's that's be very nice actually to talk talk about the uh, talk about the Orion and these absolutely magnificent uh, uh, paintings which uh, the guys have been doing over there. Mm. If, uh, and of course the other thing that that strikes uh, if you compare if you compare making a, such a a, a fictional uh, space mission with a real thing the thing that amazes one is is how fast everything is done in the sense that uh, if you make a decision. Whether it's on a costume or on a lettering or on uh, the 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 uh, you you get the satisfaction of seeing it created in some form almost immediately. Mm. 
I mean, isn't that so? I mean, if you if you say well, it doesn't seem almost immediately to me, but if I was used to yeah, but I mean, another compared time to, scale compared, compared to, to yeah. scientific time scale, yeah, I mean, it must Christ, be seen uh, very quick. Yeah, uh, I mean, in a scientific in a scientific project, uh, uh, you make any suggestion like that, and maybe it's six months. Or I mean, yeah. you take a typical typical experiment in physics. Uh, a guy has a good idea for an experiment. By the time you get an answer out these days, typically it's a year and a half. Wow. So uh, it's uh, it's a completely yeah. different order. Of it's thinking. interesting that you would feel that way because to the average person, the time scale of a movie seems like time has stopped. Most people are so bored and so astonished when they see the pace of things. Somehow they have an image in their mind that uh, it's all done in a week or something like that. And most people that I found who don't come from uh, your you know side of the fence think that everything works incredibly slowly. Well, Which is uh, you know, it just depends what you're used to. The, the thing, you know, when you, when you, you ship me over to watch that television thing, of course. Oh, that's right. You thought uh, so too. Yeah. Well, but that's a different side of it. Oh yeah. That's that's the side of, of making these sort of quantal sequences mm. in which you in which you work for three hours to extract thirty seconds on the mm. thing. That would drive me all, off of my head. But the 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 thing which uh, the, the technological side of it. Where you get an idea, say for a propulsion system or Christ knows what, and uh, within three days, well, you've got a drawing there, and you've got some guy making a model, mm. and uh, uh, you have a lot, a lot of thought on a different size. I mean, you know, like what time scale these mm. guys are using, Eastern Standard Time, and all that sort of stuff. Well, all this goes fantastically fast. I mean, mm. the number of problems that you you deal with and solve in a half an hour. Mm. Uh, is is more than you would deal with in a comparable scientific project in six months, in my opinion, mm. uh, because because of course you're just working in a different media mm. in, in a sense that you don't really have to worry, say in the case of a spaceship, about the structural stability no. of, uh, of of these uh, mm. of these 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 things. You know, I mean, you might spend six months or a year computing mm. something out on machines. Well, you know. You you know it's gonna you know it's gonna work and it can be designed. So or you take that as a premise and then you 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 you, you put something there which in principle is gonna work and it, then you can stop at that point. I mean that, that's what really constitutes yeah. the difference. In uh, it's it's very interesting. I find it extremely uh, remarkable. If these things do work that quickly, the thing that uh, does take all the time is to extract, say, two hours and 15 minutes of a story and really keep distilling and distilling and distilling and distilling and distilling, uh, I would say that um, if you count the time that's spent during the shooting day also working on the story in rehearsal and rewriting and so on, uh, I would say that an average of at least four hours a day has been spent on this story, much more than that, because in the real solid writing period it was like eight hours a day. But let's just say it averaged four hours a day for two years. Uh, say an average of six days a week. That's 24 hours a week times uh, maybe 100 weeks. I'd say there's a good uh, uh, 2,400 hours spent on uh, two and call it two hours and 40 minutes of story. So that's about a uh, uh, thousand to one, isn't it? Yeah. On the story, and that's where the real crunch is put. Uh, one doesn't get the impression that uh, that film directors do think a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, you you say that <laughs> they're supposed to, you know. Oh, I mean, you have it a helps. They're great. Uh, you know, they're great yeah. sort of. Uh, Let's get this quote. I think we ran out. Quivering read. Of, uh, the analysis, the analogy of using the frustrating wasted time periods on the set for thinking with thinking on your opponent's move in chess. Uh, we're telling you the thing about um, the daily working uh, with, with or without cutters, which I didn't completely understand. He said that when he, when he uh, directs that uh, he has a cutter who works every day and that, that you do not have a cutter who works every day and that this is somehow a good thing. Uh, with the exception of uh, a few directors like uh, David Lean and, uh, well, let's not say who, with the exception of a few directors, uh, most people 
have their film edited by film editors as they go along. And then when the film is done, they look at the film and dictate some notes about it. And the film editor tries to do what they say, and then maybe they look at it again and they do it again. But basically, it's like trying to, uh, say, uh, redesign a city by driving through it in a car, you know. Uh, you can notice a few things and say, you know, put that traffic light in the middle of the street or those buildings over there look kind of shabby or something. But if you really want to do it right, you must do it yourself, you know, piece by piece. So I think uh, by now I have enough uh, sort of ability to imagine the uh, way a scene will come out so that I can tell without editing the material if I have enough film coverage and, you know, what I can do with it. And then I, I, I edit the film with the editor myself when the film is when I'm all finished. But you haven't done any editing up to now. Uh, None, no. Uh, just the thing, just slinging together that thing you saw. Uh, because I don't, I don't see how you, I mean, you have these, you know, a couple of these few, few minute sequences, uh, this and that. I don't see how you could edit that, really. Well, how would you, well you haven't seen them. That's only a fraction of the material. In other words, what you've seen is only the comings and goings of other scenes to just show you what the set looks like. I mean, we've shot uh, about 80,000 feet of film already. See, what is 80,000 feet in time? Uh, it's about, uh, well, it's uh, 5,400 feet an hour. It's six six times nine, yeah. Fifty four hundred feet an hour. How much film will, uh, will you shoot before the, uh, the whole picture is done? By the way, that isn't a lot of film. Uh, people have shot a million feet of film, <laughs> <laughs> actually. You mean in their lives? No, I mean in a film. So, say a picture is three hours long, it would be. 16,200 feet. So what ratio is that? That's about uh, 50 to 1 or something. Isn't More. It? More. 50-something yeah. to 1. It's, like, it's almost like a 1,000. It's, like, it's almost like a 1,000 to 1. Isn't it? No, it isn't. 90% <laughs> to 1. <laughs> that is that, uh, film directing, I think, is, the, is, a, uh, is a misnomer for uh, anybody that seriously wants to make films because... Directing the film is uh, only, uh, you might say, one-third of the uh, process. You know, writing the film, directing the film, and then editing the film is, uh, you might say, the whole job. And it was really, it's only the old uh, uh, major studio uh, sort of uh, image of how a film was made that the producer held in his hand on the palette you know, the various people, the artist, the cameraman, the, the actors, the film editor, and the director, and so forth. And the director was really just sort of like a senior uh, member of the crew. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, you know, he had no real uh, integrating status in what happened. I mean, there were the few exceptional characters, even in the days of the great days of the Hollywood studios, who somehow exerted their authority over what went on. But... Um, well, and even today, uh, you know, you talk about directors have the right of, they call the first cut, which means they must approve the first cut, but then after then the producer can do whatever he wants. Uh, so it's a meaningless right, in other words. Virtually. And it's a right to try to persuade someone. Because, I mean, if you don't even have the right of the first cut, you can't even explain what you want. But I, I have, uh, you know, I do the cutting myself. Uh, you 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 have a picture of yours at this stage. Uh, is your picture completely yeah. goes out? Is that is that has it always been like that, or is that a? Uh... Um, well, let's see. It was like that on Doctor Strange Love and Lolita, and I think Paths of Glory. I don't remember. Subject to delivering the minimum uh, censorship requirements to playing it and. The way the way you make deals, the way you make that arrangement is that you say the picture will not be longer than a certain period of time, and that you will deliver the minimum required censorship so that the picture can be played. I mean, I mean, in other words, if they just say 
give it to us any way you want, and you deliver a picture that is legally unplayable, they have to protect themselves against that, isn't it? Uh, I do. What do you th feel about your pictures being shown on television? Um, well, I wish that they didn't put the commercials in. The worst thing uh, that they sometimes do is cut the films. But um, you don't retain any rights over that. Well, in some of the films, I do. But then you know, it's it's terribly difficult to uh, to police it because. Um, Unless you see the film yourself, there are very few people who are qualified to tell you what was cut. Or, in fact, I mean, even if a friend calls up and says, oh, you know, I saw uh, so, such and such a film, and uh, it looked cut, you know, and you say, well, what was cut out? They say, well, I don't know, but I, I think it was cut. Well, it's almost impossible to find out what was done. It's a peculiar problem. Preminger just lost a court case over that. Well, I believe his case was against interruption of commercials. Uh, well, I think and and uh, I don't think he was the cunning issue. I don't know. Perhaps you're right. Commercials were certainly the key thing. Mm. Uh, but uh, in, that, in, that, in that, in the Lillian Ross had a piece about that case in the uh, oh. in the New Yorker, and uh, there she uh, <laughs> described the reason why he lost, which is basically that he knew what he was doing when he signed the agreement. Mm. Well, that's it. I mean, it, they either have the right to do it or they don't. 